Hello, introduction to philosophy. Um, I'm really excited for this lecture because I love this essay and I love the opportunity to draw everything in the class together. So it's a beautiful day outside, spring day in April. I hope you all are enjoying the weather. And I wanted to start us off with a little musical interlude for your enjoyment. Today we're going to be talking about this piece, Coyote and Thales, and what they can teach us about American Indian epistemology and how it contrasts with Western epistemology. And like I said, the reason I love this piece so much is because it just helps tie together all the pieces of the course, including what we've been talking about in Ultimate Questions for, uh, for the whole semester, or a good chunk of the semester, and Ishmael. And uh, as we move into talking about Ishmael more deeply, I think this piece is a great way to bridge the gap between uh, between all the different parts of the course, including Ishmael, ultimate questions, and also the stuff we did at the beginning, talking about who we are as people and philosophy as a social activity and how it um, incorporates our humanity and who we are and how we're related to one another and the context in which we're doing this philosophy, which is during a pandemic. Um, so. That's why I like this piece, because it helps bring in all those all those different components. OK, so without further ado, in this week's lecture, we're going to talk about Coyote and Thales, uh, who they are as characters in stories, and also um, the rest of this Coyote and Thales article that was assigned for this week, including specifically four American Indian principles that are discussed in the reading, and the differences between what Native Americans and indigenous people think of as knowledge on the one hand, and what we have been talking about as knowledge as sort of part of Western philosophy. And the author says in this piece, by Western philosophy, I'm talking about what often goes under the label, just philosophy. What people assume who are doing this kind of philosophy is all of philosophy. Really, we're now going to take that whole method of doing philosophy and subject it to critical analysis from a native perspective. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about Western philosophy. We're talking about the kind of philosophy that we've been doing, which is not normally seen as a particular kind of philosophy within Western philosophy. It's just kind of seen as what philosophy is at its base. But now we're going to um, subject that view to criticism by looking at another version of what philosophy can be and what it means to ask questions and to try to make sense of the world. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ishmael and the portfolio assignment that's coming up in the next few weeks. And um, that assignment is one that you'll be working on with your groups to complete. So we'll talk about that at the end of this lecture. Okay, so who were the Coyote and Thales? Well, Coyote and Thales are two characters from contrasting traditions. Thales is discussed in ancient Greek philosophy, and Coyote is discussed within Native American philosophy. And these two characters have something in common, and what they have in common is that they're both kind of distracted. Um, distracted, that is, from noticing what's around them. So we have a story of, of Thales who gets so caught up looking at the sky and studying the heavens and thinking deeply and abstractly about um, philosophical topics that he trips and falls in a well and dies. And then we have Coyote who's commonly making mistakes similar to that. Um, so one story we get about Coyote is that he's um, ridiculed by prairie dogs and then he gets mad at the prairie dogs so he curses them and he asks for rain to flood the prairie dogs out and he asks for the water level to keep rising and then he doesn't realize that he's actually in the water also and the water's rising on him and so he ends up flooding the whole land and not realizing that if he tries to flood an area of the land over there where the prairie dogs are it's also going to flood the land where he's standing so um, so in both cases, both of these characters have made a mistake in reasoning, a mistake in, in, in failing to remember what's around them. Okay, so the difference between these two characters 
according to the author of this essay, is that Thales is sort of hailed as a model of what philosophy should be. You're supposed to be so caught up in the abstract, in analyzing the nature of humanity, for example, what it is to be a person, that you don't even notice the people around you. You don't even notice who lives right next door, is the example we get from Plato. That's sort of what it is to do philosophy and what it ought to be to do philosophy. But Coyote is ridiculed within American Indian philosophy as sort of an, an just having forgotten what is around him and as a model of something you should not do. You should not forget what's around you and what's right in front of you. You don't have your head so far stuck in the clouds that you forget who you are and where you are. Okay, so in Greek, ancient Greek philosophy, Thales is sort of presented as a role model of what we should be doing when we're doing philosophy, which is thinking so abstractly that you don't even realize who's living next door. And Coyote is ridiculed for doing just that. That is thinking so abstractly or paying attention to something else that's going on and not remembering what's right there in front of him at his feet. Okay, so that is the um, setting in which we're uh, going to learn about the differences between Native American philosophy and Western philosophy, um, those two stories are presented as sort of examples of what those differences are. Okay, now remember there are lots of complexities and nuance that we're sort of blurring and brushing over just to get a sense of how these two traditions contrast. Okay, so we get four American Indian principles from this, from this piece, and the author states at the outset, these principles are not the types of principles that you get in Western philosophy. So when we're talking about principles here, we're not talking about things like the categorical imperative or the um, uh, utilitarian uh, doctrine of what is, is right and how to calculate the best decision in any circumstance. We're not getting principles from this piece in the sense of a universal rule that always applies. That's not what a principle is here, even though that's the kind of principles we've been discussing until now. Now we're talking about what the author calls ways of being, or sort of mindsets, approaches to the world, and to the universe, to how you carry on your day-to-day -day life. Just a, a sort of mentality or mindset that you have, a way of approaching uh, life, the decisions that you make in your life. So a principle here is not a kind of hard and fast rule, it's more of a, an attitude or a way of being. Okay, so the first principle we get is the principle of relatedness. And we've already talked about that with Coyote and Thales. So the principle of relatedness brings out the connections that we have to what's around us and the relevance of being connected to what's around us and noticing our awareness of what's around us. So relatedness is really about awareness of your relations. So uh, noticing what's around you and always being attentive to where you are and what's going on around you and how you're connected to the other parts of the world, not just other people or animals, but nature and your city, your society, um, the roads around you, everything that is around you. The second principle that is a way of being is the limits of questioning principle. And that is a recognition of the fact that not all questions are worth asking. Okay, and looking at the questions themselves to see if they're worth asking. And on this Native American approach, the questions that we ask are themselves important. Which questions we're asking is a question worth asking. And the, the que which questions ought we to be asking is also an important question. And uh, as part of this view, not every question is worth asking. So that's going to be really important to keep in mind as we contrast the different approaches to what knowledge is, different approaches to theories of knowledge or epistemology, that on the Native American approach, it's not the case that more knowledge is always better. There are some questions that shouldn't be answered, some things you shouldn't even be asking. And on the Western approach, that's just not, um, not 
uh, generally seen as as how things work. And generally, on the Western approach, the more you know, the better. So, um, so those are two very different ideas here. So with the Native American approach, not every question is worth asking. Not every question is worth knowing the answer to. Some questions you're better off not asking or not knowing the answers to, even though you could know the answers. And that's an important part of that also. So even though you could know something, you ought not to. It's better not to on this American Indian approach. Okay, so this attention to the questions we're asking also brings to my mind this, um, the first piece that we read in this class from the New York Times about um, black women in philosophy because uh, the, the approach discussed there, the contribution of black women to philosophy is in part to start to question the questions, to challenge what kinds of questions we're asking and why we're asking the questions that they are and to recommend alternative sets of questions that we might turn our attention towards exploring the answers to. Okay, so this attention to the questions themselves, what questions are we asking and are they worth asking and should we find out the answers or should we not find out the answers and ask different questions instead, that is an idea that we've already encountered when we talked about black women in philosophy and the challenge to the sort of normative standard set by white men within philosophy and um, other people from other backgrounds challenging those standards that have already been set in place about what's a worthwhile uh, thing to question, what's a worthwhile pursuit within philosophy. Okay, so we've already seen challenges to the standard set mostly by white uh, males about what's worthwhile within philosophy. And we've seen the argument that we should rethink what we believe is worthwhile within philosophy. And this is sort of reiterating a similar theme that what questions we're asking is important and not all questions are worth answering. That's the limits of questioning principle. Another principle is the moral universe, and this is the idea that the universe is moral. So when we discussed ethics in this class, we drew a distinction between descriptive and normative facts. So those things that are normative have some sort of compelling or compelling nature or values. When we make normative judgments about the world, we're we're issuing values, we're, we're applying our values to the world, saying whether something is good or bad or ought to be or not. And we distinguished that in this class from what's descriptive, from just how things are in themselves without any sort of evaluation. This moral universe principle is saying that distinction doesn't apply. It's just a wrong way to think about morality is to think that we can actually pull apart what's descriptive from what's moral. On this moral universe principle, the moral stuff and the descriptive stuff come together. They're one. They're one and the same. And what does that mean? How should we think about what that means? Well, the idea is that even if you try to take the most non-evaluative stance, the most sort of neutral stance towards reality to see what is out there, what, how can I assess what is going on in the world, you're still bringing your own values to that assessment. You can't avoid it. You can't avoid looking into the world with an evaluative stance because we, we come with our values and our values show up in the world just based on where we're looking for answers. So that brings us back to the limits of questioning principle. So this idea that not every question is worth asking shows that when we decide what questions are worth asking, we're already bringing an evaluation into that picture because we're saying this thing is worth knowing if we're pursuing the answers to that thing. Okay, so the idea is that the universe is moral. We can't sort of detach from the evaluative component of things and look at them um, with no with no values, with no sort of um, evaluate, evaluation, because by looking, we're already bringing our values into the picture.
Ozzy just woke up, so the rest of this lecture might get a little interesting. Um, uh, that's why I'm a bit speechless, but I'm just going to move on to the meaning-making principle of action. Okay, This is the idea that how we go about doing stuff in the world actually creates the meaning in the world. So we're going to see when we compare Native and Western approaches to epistemology that for, on the Western approach, there's this idea that sort of the world is out there and we can come to it and perceive it and take it in and make sense of it. But on this view, how we go about doing that, how we go about going out into the world and taking it in actually reshapes the world that we find. So you can't, you're not an observer that's extracted from the situation that you're observing as as if you're watching something on television when you go out and observe the world and try to learn about it you're actually in the world you're observing and your observation itself is making a difference to what is going on in the world how you approach the world makes a difference it's like when i try to film ozzy doing something cool i come up and then i have the camera and then they just it changes the vibe once they're on camera, right? It's it's not as if I can ever capture that without actually being there and changing it as I'm trying to capture it. Okay, so this is the idea here, is that how we act within the world actually shapes it. We're, we're participating in the creation of the world as we act within the world. All of these principles again, these are sort of mindsets or ways of being, are related, which brings us back to the principle of relatedness, right? These are all connected. So if you're thinking, wasn't that part of the last principle? Yes, it was, because the reason the moral, the reason the universe is moral, for instance, is partly because of how what we do shapes the universe. Okay, so these are all connected, and like the author points out, we have only just scratched the surface but I encourage you to read this essay carefully. Read it a couple times because there is so much in here and I'm sure that I'm not going to get everything in this lecture. So go back and read it for yourself and try to make sense of it for yourself so that you can um, have that understanding with you as you approach the last part of the semester in which we're going to turn to Ishmael. And Ishmael is talking about takers and leavers, okay? So uh, leavers are indigenous people, they're native people. So you should be looking out through this lecture as I'm talking about this essay about Coyote and Thales, be on the lookout for ways that that also connects to Ishmael's discussion of native populations, indigenous people. Okay, there's just so much here. I'm, I love this part of the class because I feel like it's the grand finale. And so I hope that I'm able to convey some of these connections, but a lot of that work to connect different parts of the course you're going to be doing yourself. But we'll talk about that. Okay, so Western versus Native knowledge. So I'm going to pull up this T chart here, which lists a lot of differences, and then I'm going to talk about them. And hopefully that will give you a good grasp of how these are different. But again, I encourage you to go back and reread the essay. Uh, because there's a lot of detail in there that I'm going to have to skip over as I talk about these ideas. Okay, so um, if this is overwhelming, just cover up part of the screen as I move through it. Okay, so Western knowledge is concerned with propositional knowledge. That's where we started our discussion of epistemology. Knowledge is propositional. We contrasted that with knowing how to do something or knowledge of familiarity, like knowing your friend's uncle. Propositional knowledge is knowledge that something, not knowing that something is true. It's knowing the facts. Okay. Well, already we have a presumption that what that Native American philosophy, Native American epistemology is going to challenge. And that is the notion that propositional knowledge is sort of the end all be all, the primary thing we need to understand the nature of, right? They're saying, no, propositional knowledge is just one kind of knowledge, and it's really not that important. What's far more important and basic and, and uh, primary is this sort of lived or embodied knowledge that we might call wisdom instead of knowledge, okay? 
This is the kind of knowledge that you get from actually practicing being in the world, from your lived experience. Okay, so on the Western side, what it takes to have propositional knowledge is to have a true justified belief. That was the definition of knowledge that we started out with, that we were working with in our discussion of epistemology. Well, on the native side, knowledge is practical. It has to be able to be put to use. It's not justified in the sense of having another fact that gives you a reason to believe the first fact. That's what it is to be justified, like we talked about at length in the discussion of epistemology. But for the native on this American Indian picture, native knowledge is unjustifiable in the sense that you don't have some further fact that justifies the piece of knowledge you're talking about. It's it just knowledge is wisdom in the sense that it helps you get around it. It's useful. And so it's not justified by other pieces of knowledge. And furthermore, the notion of knowledge as true justified belief leaves us with this predicament that I've written, I've, I've uh, noted here as this foundationalism or an infinite regress. I put that on the screen here. So the idea, the, the critique of this Western definition of knowledge as true justified belief is that if that's what we think knowledge is, if knowledge is propositional and it's true justified belief, then you have this predicament. Either you believe in foundationalism in which something is justified. So some belief X is justified by some further belief Y. Okay, think about arguments now. When we write an argument, we're listing the justifications for some conclusion. Okay, so foundationalism is one way to think about the need for justification because the foundationalist says, well, some belief X is justified by some belief Y is justified by some belief Z, which is justified by some further belief. And eventually you follow that chain and you get to some foundational belief that has no justification. It's justified in itself. And that was Descartes. Descartes, for example, gave us an example of a foundational belief, which was I think. Right? That's the belief that's justified in itself because each time you think it, you make it true. Okay, so the, the critique of this is that that's not really a, a plausible path, right? We, we don't justify everything we know on the basis of this one belief, I think. It's, that's not how knowledge works. The other option, if you think knowledge is propositional and it's true justified belief, is that you just have an infinite regress because the justifications just go on forever. And that's not plausible either, okay? According to this uh, American Indian critique of Western knowledge. Instead, on the, wet, on the native approach, we should not think of knowledge as true justified belief. We should not think about knowledge as propositional, as knowing the facts and having a reason for each fact you believe. That, that's just the wrong way to think about these things. And the idea that that leaves us stuck having to decide between foundationalism or an infinite regress is further evidence that that's, that's just the wrong way to think about knowledge, right? Instead, knowledge is practical. It, it, it's good if it works, and it's bad if it doesn't work. And that's how knowledge is, right? That's what knowledge is. It's, it, knowledge has to be put to the test. If it doesn't help you in any way, then back to the limits of questioning principle, it's not worth knowing, right? And so the native approach gives us this example, another legend, and that's another difference between native and Western knowledge, that Western knowledge is a list of facts or information, and native knowledge is often passed down through the, uh, through the method of stories, storytelling, Okay, but we have this story, this legend of the universe resting on the back of a turtle. And then the Western person comes and says, the Western philosopher says, well, what's the turtle resting on, right? And so the person telling this legend just says, it's just turtles all the way down. Like an, an expression of exasperation. Like, I don't see why you could even ask that question. Like, it's just not a question worth asking, right? If you are asking, what does the turtle rest on? You're missing the point of the legend, okay? You're, you're just 
you're just not getting it. Okay, so the reason you're not getting it is probably because you think of knowledge as true justified belief, and that's just the wrong way to think of knowledge, right? There's no justification for thinking that the universe rests on the back of a turtle. Instead, it's a, it's a story that's used for its practical import. Okay. On the Western approach, knowledge is seen as an end in itself. That's why it's something that we always want more of, right? Because that's what we're working towards. Why do you want to know this thing? Well, there's no reason beyond that that you want to know it. It's just that knowledge itself is good. But on the native approach, knowledge has to be conducive to some end that you have. And what you're learning is actually shaped by those ends, by what your goals are. So you have to keep in mind, what are your goals and why, why are you um, reaching towards what you're reaching towards and what is it helpful to know in order to achieve those ends? Not all knowledge is useful and not all knowledge therefore is an end in itself. So on the native approach, again, Knowledge has to be conducive to some goal that you have or to some aim of yours. Whereas on the Western approach, all knowledge is good. If you don't know something, it's better to find it out, right? Well, that is a violation of the limits of questioning principle. So that's why there's a limits of questioning principle is that knowledge is only worthwhile if it is conducive to the ends that we have. Okay, in the, on the Western picture, knowledge is this sort of abstract thing that's out there in the world. And on the native picture, knowledge is right in front of you. It's, it's what's at your feet in that sense. It has to, it, it's part of your lived experience. You're embodying it at the moment. So how you move is an expression of your knowledge or your wisdom. And it's not as if you're just this inert thing trying to perceive the universe or the the world out there as separate from you it's at the intersection of where you meet the world okay western knowledge involves hypothesis testing you formulate a hypothesis and then you go out and you run tests to see if your hypothesis is true and then maybe you re uh reframe your hypothesis or you uh make adjustments to your hypothesis and then you test your next hypothesis etc on the native picture knowledge is obtained through listening and observation so you're not trying to prove some point instead you're just openly accepting what's out there to be accepted paying attention without having an agenda on the western approach oh this is backwards Oh no. On the Western approach, knowledge is I. On the native approach, it's we. Okay, so uh, Western knowledge has to do with the knower, right? Remember back to Descartes, that's where it all started. The foundation of all knowledge, Descartes thought, was knowing that you are a thinker that is in the first person, right? I perceive I'm the one who knows. I am the, um, the knower, the subject that gets to obtain knowledge. On the native approach, it's collective. It's a we kind of thing. Knowledge is passed through generations. It's collective knowledge. And hopefully this reminds you of Ishmael because this comes up so much in Ishmael, how um, we have cultural amnesia, right, as takers. We think that we're sort of the, the first, the beginning of humanity, right? But in the native uh, population, that knowledge is, is ancient. It comes from long ago, from people who are long gone. And um, it develops through generations over time. And so the subject that gets to do the knowing, the subject that obtains knowledge or that obtains wisdom is a collective. It's a, it's a um, unified group um, that's referred to in the first person as we, right? It's, it's everyone in our culture who has, who has developed this knowledge over time. And that's why if we forget it, it's lost forever. You can't get back what 
a culture has passed down through centuries and centuries and centuries through st- through st- uh, storytelling and and uh, sort of mastering the art of living in connection with the land that you live on. Okay, so the land piece is also really important here about uh, uh, in relation to why knowledge is lost if it's forgotten because you you develop within a certain surrounding okay and that brings us back to the principle of relatedness so there are connections everywhere here and i'm i'm not going to be able to mention them all and so that's why i'm going to turn that over to you to do that um to to engage in that exercise as part of the ishmael portfolio but that all contrasts with western knowledge which is seen as eternal like if you forget and the way to get knowledge for Descartes, right, and who who sort of is seen as the father of this tradition, is to start from scratch. Start by erasing everything in your mind. Remember, that's what Descartes did. He wanted to throw out everything he believed. That's why we, he gave us the dream argument, and the argument for skepticism, because he wanted to show like nothing we believe is certain. And so, to get to certainty, we have to start from scratch. Well. And then we can get what's eternal and true and everlasting, like grasping onto a rock with a metal fist, okay? That's not the way knowledge is in the native community. If you wiped the slate clean to start from scratch, then you wouldn't know anything and you couldn't get back to learn anything without having lived for generations in a place where you get to know the place and you get to learn how to be in the world in that place. Okay, so... um, so again, there's just so much going on in this in this essay. I encourage you to read it a couple times. It's only 12 pages. So, um, and once you've read it the first time, then it should be easier to read it the second time. But, but it will really help you as you start to think about connections in this class, which is part of the assignment for the Ishmael portfolio. Okay, and we have this story to contrast Western and Native uh, epistemologies, the story of corn, beans, and squash. And so in the native tradition, this story is about three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, and they work together and they live in harmony. And this helped Native American farmers farm the land effectively because they planted these things um, in succession. And apparently this is a good thing to plant in succession because the Um, Each thing sort of uh, nourishes the soil in the right way to provide the sustenance for the next thing you plant. And the point is that the farmer, Native American farmers, got to know how to farm by using this story and understanding these, uh, the story of the three sisters and how they connected. And then the Western farmers came along and they um, used this very segmented approach where they said, well, if you they test the soil and then they uh, try to add what's missing and then they do this whole convoluted procedure to test using hypothesis testing and the kinds of approach to knowing that we've just been discussing and they end up just doing a much less good job farming the land. They make less, they don't get as much of a yield. So the idea is that um, through storytelling, Native Americans have gained this knowledge which is really wisdom of experience. It's not a, something that they could list as a set of facts. Whereas the Western farmers come along and try to uh, lay out the facts, try to get everything sort of lined up and separate it out and, and fail to be able to understand the, um, the process holistically. Okay, so it's just one example, and it's an oversimplification of uh, these diff- contrasting approaches, but um, it's worthwhile for understanding how Native epistemology and Western epistemology are different. Okay, so Ishmael. Okay, so how does that all connect? Well, again, Ishmael is talking about Native people and Native societies. Those are the levers. Okay, and so there's so much of so much of Ishmael is echoed in this piece about Native American epistemology, um, which is why I incorporate this piece to tie everything together. But um, but I want you to think about how the 
levers in Ishmael and how Tager culture are echoed in the Coyote and Thales piece and how the Western and Native approaches to epistemology contrast how that contrast is connected to the contrast between takers and leavers. And um, while we're on this topic, to also think about the lecture, the previous lecture on indigenous ethics, right? Ethics of care from a feminist and an indigenous perspective, um, there are a lot of overlapping themes, which you might be picking up on, between Native American ethics, ethics of care, and Native American epistemology. And that's not by chance, because what we've already said is that for the Native, on the Native picture, knowing it, the universe is moral, right? So ethics and epistemology are, cannot be separated, okay? So that's why when we're talking about Native American ethics and Native American epistemology, we are talking about a lot of the same themes because these things go together. My neighbor's just leaving on his motorcycle. Maybe you can hear that. Um, but, okay, so those things go together and overlap. Knowledge, epistemology, epistemology, again, is the study of knowledge um, and ethics within Native American philosophy.